Chapter Sixteen of Napoleon the First: An Intimate Biography by Walter Gere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixteen, eighteen hundred nine, Vagram. The emperor's sudden and unexpected return to Paris had been caused by events of momentous importance in the internal and external politics of France even as early as eighteen hundred five his minister of finance godin had made the remark to him that the empire had been increased to a point where only he was capable of governing it two years later metternich the austrian diplomat made the same observation it is remarkable that napoleon has not yet taken the first step towards assuring the existence of his successors in eighteen hundred nine he added his death will be the signal for a new and terrible bouleversement these signs of the times had not escaped the notice of the clear-headed talleyrand on the second of january napoleon received at his headquarters in spain the reports of a rapprochement of those usually envious rivals talleyrand and fouché who now walked arm in arm held private conferences and seemed to have some secret understanding with his ambitious brother-in-law murat in spite of the assertions of lanfray and other historians there is evidence of an intrigue by no means insignificant conducted by these ministers and others who were alarmed over the continental system of the emperor in general and the spanish enterprise in particular but whatever impression this news may have made on the emperor the consideration of austria's attitude was of greater weight in determining him to leave spain during his absence that power had been pushing forward its military preparations and appeared determined upon war with napoleon and most of his veteran troops deeply involved in the spanish undertaking austria thought that the moment was opportune to recover her lost possessions her desperate financial situation furnished another argument in favour of immediate action for the army could be maintained at its full complement only until spring the subsidies which had been asked from england had been promised only upon the actual commencement of hostilities austria had also hoped for assistance from prussia but the king on his return from a visit to the czar at st petersburg had positively refused to take any part in warlike operations and strongly advised austria to preserve the peace this stand of frederick william was very depressing to the vienna court as it showed that the czar was still sincere in his friendship for france notwithstanding all these discouragements austria decided to go ahead it is impossible to state to what extent napoleon was advised of the austrian plans before his return to paris but he certainly had enough information to put him on his guard at this time he had only ninety thousand men in germany under davout and Oudinot. he immediately took steps to organize a new army of one hundred sixty thousand young recruits he withdrew two divisions and the guard from spain and ordered some troops which were on their way there to face about and proceed to germany napoleon's first orders were for davout to leave good garrisons in the fortresses and with forty five thousand men to rendezvous at bamberg oudinot was ordered to augsburg lannes was called back from spain and messina who was actually at lyon with thirty thousand men en route for the peninsula was sent to strasbourg the confederation of the rhine was called on to mobilize thirty thousand men by the end of march the emperor counted on having one hundred forty thousand troops in bavaria while the guard would soon be there the archduke charles who had been for many months in charge of austrian military matters had made a supreme effort to raise a force capable of competing with napoleon and he had done his work well the active army consisted of over three hundred thousand men divided on the french system into ten corps seven corps under charles were assembled in bohemia ready to debouch into bavaria at ratisbon john was to head two corps in italy while ferdinand was to invade poland with the remaining corps in an order issued from paris the last of march the emperor placed berthier in charge of operations and indicated to him the general plan he was to pursue until he himself should reach the front the key note of this order which the emperor sounded again and again was should the austrians attack the army is to concentrate behind the lesh by the word attack he meant of course an advance into bavaria with the intent of attacking the french forces nothing could be clearer armed with these orders which no doubt were supplemented by verbal instructions berthier left paris the last day of march and arrived at strasbourg on the fourth of april on the eighth of april the emperor issued the order for the final organization of the army 
there were to be six corps under the command of lanne davout massena lefebvre augereau and bernadotte the cavalry reserve under bessieres and the guard about three hundred thousand men in all the total austrian levies were also about three hundred thousand men under the colours with one hundred thousand landwehrer in reserve military skill quite apart it was about an even match but with napoleon in command the french had a marked superiority the enemy always regarded his presence on the field of battle as equal to an army corps of fifty thousand men having learned at paris late on the twelfth of april that the austrians had crossed the inn on the tenth the emperor started for the front at daylight the next morning at that time messages were transmitted by a number of telegraph or semaphore stations which had been established in central and southern germany all converging on strasbourg from which place there were some forty stations to paris on his arrival at donauwert on the morning of the seventeenth of april the emperor learned with dismay that berthier had blundered terribly in carrying out his orders the enemy stood substantially in one body in front of landshut on the isar while the isolated french left wing under davout was in danger of being cut off at ratisbon less than thirty miles to the north the french right wing at augsburg seventy miles away was equally isolated and the sparsely held centre could easily have been pierced as jomini says twenty campaigns had impressed no comprehension of strategy on berthier instead of being concentrated the army was widely scattered in the face of the enemy is there any wonder asks dodge when the man nearest the emperor was so obtuse that napoleon's new method of war so long remained a puzzle the only thing which saved the french army from disaster was the archduke's awe of his formidable opponent and his excess of caution fortunately the emperor arrived in time despite the dangerous situation there was yet hope in speed and purpose almost any other general would have ordered davout to fall back by way of the north bank of the danube but the emperor assumed that a bold front was the safest defence and davout was directed to march on the south bank in battle order and ready for attack at the same time messena at augsburg was ordered to start in light order and march towards ingolstadt owing to the archduke's slowness the emperor thus recovered the initiative and turned a dangerous position into the offensive in one day his mastermind had completely changed the conditions in a postscript to Massena's orders he wrote in his own hand activity activity speed what saved the situation was the speed with which the marshals executed his orders added to the accurate directions he gave their march had charles even then have divined the conditions and pushed in with vigour he might have driven napoleon back to the rhine but he could not see and act as quickly as his great opponent and he feared to venture on a bold manoeuvre with napoleon in his front it would be tedious to attempt to give in detail the operations which followed even the most reliable contemporary records and the best historians do not agree but the strategy and the grand tactics are plain charles had been decisively outmanoeuvred whereas at landshut he had been concentrated opposite the weak french centre which he could have brushed away like a cobweb his own line was now long and scattered there was a gap between the austrian right and left wings held by a slender cordon of troops which the french could dislodge and cut the army in two napoleon now had the precise opportunity which charles had neglected and he was not slow to take advantage of it and yet says dodge the archduke was a soldier of high rank perhaps with wellington the strongest of his contemporaries except when the gigantic personality of napoleon overshadowed him and robbed him of the push and purpose he really possessed in the four days from the nineteenth to the twenty second of april the emperor compelled the archduke to abandon his offensive movement which had hardly begun and to retire to the north bank of the danube never before had napoleon acted with more intense energy nor had he ever made such calls upon his troops and obtained such a splendid response he was always more proud of this series of manoeuvres than of any other he conducted on the twelfth of april he was in paris four days later he was at the front and in a short week he had won two battles abensburg which cut the enemy in two and isolated the austrian left and ekmul which broke the austrian right he considered these operations infinitely superior to those of marengo and the most brilliant and able of his career like caesar he might have said veni vidi vici in his proclamation to the army issued the twenty fourth of april at ratisbon 
the emperor stated that a hundred pieces of cannon forty flags and fifty thousand prisoners had been captured in conclusion he said before a month we shall be in vienna the emperor was mistaken he was there in three weeks in this campaign napoleon for the last time showed all the activity of the days of italy he was always in motion always present at the important point hardly giving an instant to rest or food there were no bounds to his capacity for work napoleon soon abandoned the idea of pursuing charles along the left bank of the danube there were many excellent defensive positions in bohemia which would delay his advance to vienna he therefore decided to follow the old route along the right bank on the tenth of may just one month after charles had invaded bavaria napoleon stood in front of vienna which surrendered after a feeble defence three days later napoleon's chief preoccupation now was the means of crossing the danube so as to attract the austrian army it will be recalled that in eighteen hundred five murat had won the floridsdorf bridge by a ruse de guerre but this time it had been destroyed every day's delay would give the enemy time to fortify the positions opposite all the known crossings no operation in war is more difficult than the passage of a river in the face of the enemy and yet the operation is equally difficult to resist and prior to the great war when the rivers were held in force along their entire course it was generally successful down to within a few miles of vienna the danube flows in a kind of a gorge with its channel narrowed by the mountains on either side but just above the city the channel opens out into a series of arms containing numerous small and several large islands affording many places for crossings below vienna there is one very large island lobau shaped somewhat like a pear and in dimensions nearly three miles east and west by a little less north and south lobau is separated from the south bank by several other large islands among which runs the main current much shallower and slower at this point than above the city two bridges were built here one fifteen hundred and the other eight hundred feet in length between the island and the north bank the arm is less than four hundred feet wide lobau may thus be described as a fortress with a broad moat in front it afforded shelter for a large force and seemed to be the most available point for crossing the main bridge in three sections which was built under the supervision of messina was composed of big freight boats found at the city wharves which were of various sizes and called for much adjustment it was also difficult to anchor them in the swift current which was now swollen by the melted snow from the mountains at the source as in eighteen hundred five napoleon had made his headquarters at schoenbrunn but on the nineteenth of may he went to kaiser eberstoff to watch proceedings on the left bank of the river opposite lobau lies the marshfeld a wide slightly rolling plain about a mile from the river and about as far apart are situated the villages of aspern and Essling. the curtain connecting the two places was an inconsiderable depression in the ground and a slightly embanked road which gave very little if any defensive strength but it was different with the two villages which formed natural bastions aspern which was much the larger boasted of two streets while essling had but one both were solidly built of stone and were surrounded by low embankments to keep out high floods from the river each of them had strong réduits in the form of buildings of very substantial construction in aspern the church and the cemetery at the western end formed a sort of citadel from which the streets were enfiladed in essling there was a large granary in the centre and a walled enclosure farther west by noon on the twentieth the big bridge from the south shore was completed and at six o'clock the same afternoon a pontoon was thrown across the narrow arm to the north shore and bessieres with two divisions of cavalry passed over and took possession of the ground between aspern and essling other troops followed during the night such conflicting reports were brought in by the reconnoitring light horse that at midnight the emperor sent messina over to ascertain what was in front he mounted the clock tower of aspern and satisfied himself that the austrian army was encamped along the rusbach about ten miles to the northeast at daybreak the emperor himself rode out with bessieres lannes and messina a glance at the map will show that the essential thing to do was to occupy the two villages with a force capable of holding them until the rest of the army had time to cross dodge says that no orders to this effect were given and that the neglect on napoleon's part is hard to explain 
but this statement does not seem to be correct the numbers of the opposing forces at vienna and in the neighbourhood were about one hundred ten thousand french and one hundred five thousand austrians the archduke who had been closely watching the french movements had laid his plans to wait until part of their army had crossed and then to attack it in force at midday on the twenty first the austrian advance began the necessary materials for breaking the bridges had previously been collected the austrians numbered about eighty thousand to forty thousand french who under messina at aspern and lannes at essling had occupied and strongly fortified these two natural redoubts napoleon's plan was to hold on to these two strong flank positions and thus gain time for his remaining divisions to debouch into the marchfeld the brunt of the first day's battle fell on aspern which was taken and retaken several times and at evening remained in the hands of the austrians their attacks on essling were less successful early in the day a rapid rise of the waters in the river seriously damaged the main bridge but by midnight it was sufficiently restored to enable one cavalry and four infantry divisions making a total of thirty thousand men to cross when the battle was resumed on the following day napoleon detailed three divisions to recapture and hold aspern and sent two to reinforce essling while the guard and two infantry and three cavalry divisions formed the centre at three o'clock in the morning messina seized aspern by a sudden attack while len at essling repulsed two austrian columns at seven the emperor launched his centre in a strong attack upon the austrian centre which began to waver and was only rallied by the personal efforts of the archduke about nine o'clock napoleon learned that the bridges had once more broken down and that davout would be unable to cross that day at one o'clock he ordered a retreat to lobau the retreat was covered by messina who did not retire from aspern and essling until three o'clock the following morning when he finally withdrew to the island with the guard unpursued and destroying the pontoon bridges behind him the fighting of the french had been beyond words to praise and charles who had really put in his last man was obliged to rest content with the laurels already won with overwhelming superiority in numbers he had fought what was practically a drawn battle with his great opponent but which would almost certainly have been a french victory if davout's corps had been able to cross in the face of these facts the historians hostile to napoleon have claimed that he was defeated towards the end of the battle lannes who was sitting with his legs crossed was struck on the knee by a cannon-ball which ricocheted off the ground just in front of him he was removed to the rear and the surgeons decided that it was necessary to amputate his right leg the marshal bore the operation well he was removed to vienna where he died a week later from infection of the wound which in those days before the discovery of antiseptics was difficult to prevent he was the first of the marshals to lose his life at st helena the emperor said lan was a man of extraordinary bravery as a general he was infinitely superior to moreau and soult napoleon was much affected by his death which he regarded as a great personal loss at three o'clock in the morning of the twenty third of may in a raging thunderstorm napoleon and berthier made in a small boat the perilous passage across the still rising waters of the danube from lobau to ebersdorf here the emperor is said to have slept for twenty-four hours this is not probable in his case although he had had little if any sleep for two days and had been all the time in the thick of the fight napoleon unlike some modern commanders was not in the habit of conducting operations from a bomb-proof chateau many leagues from the front the operations in italy began during the second week in april after archduke john arrived on the scene eugene was defeated and thrown back across the piave to caldiero east of verona where napoleon met his only reverse in the campaign of italy john pursued but made no further attack it was already known that the archduke charles had been driven from bavaria and john received orders to retreat his first intention was to retire slowly but when he heard of napoleon's rapid advance on vienna he hastened his march he was closely followed by eugene and macdonald after aspern both commanders employed the next few days in calling up reinforcements charles ordered two corps to join him and directed john to fall back to pressburg napoleon drew in bernadotte and vandamme and sent eugene and macdonald into hungary to contain the archduke john vigorously pursued by the viceroy 
john on the fourteenth of june took up a position for action on the heights southeast of raab but was again worsted and forced to continue his retreat he did not finally reach pressburg until the fourth of july another side operation in the campaign was marmont's march from dalmatia to the danube starting the last of april after frequent encounters on the way he finally reached vienna on the third of july napoleon had arranged to concentrate all of his forces at vienna the last week in june regardless of his communications and all of his marshals were ordered up by forced marches he left only some thirty-five thousand men detached at various points and on the fourth of july he was prepared to debouch into the marchfeld with one hundred seventy-five thousand men and five hundred guns charles was not so successful in drawing in his detached bodies and when the crisis developed he had ninety five thousand men at distant points and only one hundred thirty five thousand men and four hundred guns in hand his forces were grouped to strike at the french army while it was crossing the river and before the operation was completed as he had done at aspern or in case this plan failed to receive the enemy's attack at wagram behind the rustback napoleon's plan was to effect the crossing as rapidly as possible and at an unexpected point the army was once more to be concentrated in the lobau and sent over in a mass by the southern end of the stadler branch opposite the extreme left wing of the austrians the troops were to cross on ten pontoon bridges which were to be thrown over at the last moment and the whole movement was to be covered by the numerous batteries which had been erected on the north shore of the lobau and armed with one hundred heavy guns during the month of june two very solid bridges protected by stockades had been built from the south shore over to the lobau an elaborate pretense was also made of preparations to cross at the old point opposite aspern the enemy fell into the trap and massed troops there when all his preparations were completed on the evening of the fourth of july in stormy weather that favoured secrecy napoleon sent his army across by the southern extremity of the stadler branch by noon the following day incredible as it may seem his whole army of about one hundred fifty thousand men was in line of battle north of the danube during the first five days of july punctual to a moment the four corps of davout marmont eugene and vride had all come up by forced marches and joined napoleon at the lobau when the day of battle arrived the austrians on the field numbered one hundred ten thousand against napoleon's one hundred seventy thousand men finding that the main body of the austrians was assembled at wagram behind the rustback some six miles away napoleon decided to advance into the marchfeld this movement was completed about six o'clock and notwithstanding the lateness of the hour the emperor ordered an immediate attack on wagram in order to pierce the austrian line which was extended over a front of about ten miles his tactical deployment was not complete but he wanted to strike home before the archduke had time to concentrate the attempt however failed the grand tactics of the battle on the following day were very similar to those of austerlitz the archduke designed an enveloping attack from both wings the right wing under clenau advanced towards aspern with the idea of cutting the french line of retreat to lobau and vienna messina was ordered to incline to the left to meet him at the same time the austrians left under rosenberg started out to drive back davout on the french right so as to clear the road for the approach of archduke john who was expected to arrive from pressburg this movement failed and rosenberg fell back again then napoleon ordered davout to advance against the austrian left which he rolled up until like the russian wing at Elo, it stood at right angles to its earlier position as soon as the emperor saw that davout had accomplished his task he formed the corps of macdonald into a solid column supported by a one hundred gun battery and launched it against the austrian centre it was like a blow in the solar plexus and the enemy reeled from the shock this decided the battle and by two o'clock the austrians were in full retreat charles had put in all his men and john's small corps was still ten miles away and could not be counted on the emperor still had in reserve marmont's corps and the guard over twenty thousand men charles who was always cautious deemed it wiser to preserve his beaten but by no means disorganized army and run no further risk his conduct of the battle had been excellent wagram although a victory for napoleon was by no means as decisive as austerlitz or jena 
the emperor has been criticized for not pursuing the enemy with more vigor but both he and his men were exhausted they had little or no sleep for two days and had been fighting for nearly thirty hours the july day had been excessively hot and the men had suffered much for lack of water the three marshals who led the pursuit after jena were absent murat and ney were in spain and lannes was dead messina had been injured by a fall from his horse two days before and conducted the operations of his corps from a calèche his brilliant cavalry leader la salle was killed in the moment of victory bessieres who commanded the cavalry of the old guard had a horse shot under him and was so shaken up by the fall that he had to turn over the command to a subordinate there were three lines of retreat open to the archduke by his left into hungary where he could join his brother back of his centre on moravia and to his right on bohemia where prague would furnish him a base rich in supplies for napoleon it was best to cut charles off from hungary and vagram had been fought with this end in view charles chose the latter alternative and retired towards Znaim. here five days after the battle he proposed an armistice which napoleon immediately accepted in the treaty of schonbrunn signed the fourteenth of october napoleon dictated his own terms the emperor francis gave up his only remaining seaport trieste and austrian poland was added to the grand duchy of warsaw and salzburg to bavaria besides losing three million and a half subjects austria had to pay an indemnity of eighty-five million francs napoleon had never learned to follow the sage advice of old frederick the great never maltreat an enemy by halves the only statesmanlike alternatives says rose were to win his friendship by generous treatment or to crush him to the earth so that he could not rise to deal another blow if napoleon at this time had been as wise as was bismarck after sadowa two generations later he might have converted his future father-in-law into a firm friend and ally who would have ensured his dynasty but his paramount thought was still the english vendetta russia with her extensive sea-coast seemed to him of far more importance in his continental system than land-locked austria he therefore preferred the uncertain alliance of alexander to the almost certain friendship of francis at vienna in the summer of eighteen hundred nine napoleon stood at the parting of the ways and he took the wrong path he no longer had the level-headed talleyrand by his side to advise him when napoleon left paris on the thirteenth of april he was accompanied by josephine as far as strasbourg where they arrived on the sixteenth at four o'clock in the morning in the almost incredibly short time of three days the fastest express now takes nine hours to make the run of three hundred twelve miles at strasbourg they said adieu and the emperor immediately crossed the rhine while the empress remained for several weeks during the campaign napoleon sent josephine from time to time brief notes telling of his health and his movements very different from the burning letters of his first campaign the increasing anxiety of josephine affected her health and in june she went to plombieres to take the waters she was there a month later when she received the letters announcing the victory of vagram and the truce of Znaim. she would have liked to join the emperor at vienna but he wrote her that the weather was very hot and advised her to go to malmaison he was enjoying the society of the lovely marie valeska and did not care for the company of his wife napoleon left schonbrunn on the fifteenth of october before receiving news of the final ratification of the treaty of peace and proceeded to munich from there he sent a courier to announce his arrival at fontainebleau on the evening of the twenty seventh on which date he wished to have the court in residence there but he travelled with such speed that he arrived thirty hours ahead of time and found no one except the concierge to receive him to pass the time he visited the new apartments of the chateau which had been furnished with great magnificence to cambacerès who arrived earlier than the other courtiers he announced his fixed determination to repudiate josephine and marry a princess of russia or of austria on josephine's arrival from st cloud late in the afternoon she had a very cold reception from the emperor yet later they dined together and he was pleasant and almost gay but at the end of the evening she discovered that the door of the private staircase which communicated with the apartment of the emperor had been closed and she knew then that the divorce was only a question of time more absolute and more imperious than ever napoleon no longer allowed any contradiction in his family or from his ministers 
every one obeyed and kept silent in the words of m Thiers, his personal aspect had remarkably changed at this period from being sombre and thin as he was formerly he had become open assured plein d'un bon point without his face being less handsome from being taciturn he had become a great talker in a word his all-powerful nature had completely blossomed out and it was to fade away like his fortune for nothing stands still the only thing which troubled napoleon in the midst of all his prosperity was the fact that his immense empire had no heir but with the divorce this would be remedied he would marry the princess of his choice and she would bear him a son since she had become empress josephine had given him no cause for reproach she was a model of sweetness of submission of resignation and of fidelity she endeavoured constantly to meet his wishes to anticipate his least desires and napoleon was really touched to see her so affectionate and so submissive when the court left fontainebleau the fourteenth of november josephine was not yet informed of her fate napoleon had not yet spoken and she still had hope they did not make the trip to paris together as the emperor rode most of the distance on horseback on entering the capital at nightfall after an absence of just seven months napoleon stopped at the elysee to make a short call on the king of saxony who had arrived the night before and then went on to the tuileries for dinner there was soon a regular assembly of crowned heads at paris besides the king of saxony the king of Württemberg, the king and queen of holland the king and queen of westphalia and the princes of the confederation of the rhine came to pay their court to the sovereign of sovereigns it was in the presence of so many princes that the cruel sacrifice of the divorce was to be consummated and by the irony of fate the court had never been so brilliant as at the moment that the empress was to leave it for ever napoleon usually so prompt to put his plans into execution hesitated when the moment approached to break with the wife who for fourteen years had been associated with his destiny and who recalled the most brilliant days of his youth and his glory the charm of the past came back and he could not make up his mind to break a heart so tender and so devoted the prefet du palais m de Bousset, draws this sketch of josephine at the time of the divorce the empress was forty-six years old no woman could have more grace of manner and bearing her eyes were enchanting her smile full of charm her voice of an extreme softness her form noble supple perfect her toilettes were always elegant and in perfect taste and made her appear much younger than she really was but all this was as nothing beside the goodness of her heart her esprit was amiable never did she wound the amour propre of any one never had she anything disagreeable to say her disposition was always even and placid devoted to napoleon she communicated to him without his perceiving it her kindness and goodness finally on the last day of november the emperor decided to break to her the fatal news this memorable scene which napoleon himself called a tragedy has been described by m de Bousset, who was one of the spectators and even one of the actors napoleon and josephine had dined together in a room on the first floor adjoining his bedchamber neither of them touched the dishes which were placed before them after dinner they went into the room known as the salon de l'empereur between the throne room and the galerie de diane when they were alone the emperor decided to speak he said that the safety of the empire demanded a supreme sacrifice and that he counted on the courage of josephine to consent to a divorce to which he himself had had great difficulty in making up his mind at the word divorce josephine burst into tears and fell as if in a swoon the emperor then called Bosset, and they carried the empress down the narrow and winding staircase to her apartment on the ground floor here they placed her on a sofa and after ringing for a maid the emperor retired with his eyes full of tears friday evening the fifteenth of december eighteen hundred nine was the time chosen by the emperor for the dissolution of his civil marriage at nine o'clock all the sovereigns present at paris and all of the grand dignitaries of the empire assembled in the same salon where the news of the divorce had been broken to josephine the emperor then read an address in which he spoke of the necessity for an heir to the throne and of the loss of hope that he could have children by his beloved spouse the empress josephine which rendered necessary the dissolution of their marriage 
josephine then read her statement in which she expressed her willingness to give this great proof of her attachment and devotion to the one who had crowned her and to whose kindness she owed everything the following day josephine left the tuileries for ever to take up her residence at malmaison she kept the title of empress and received an allowance of two million francs from the state the emperor knew that it was useless to ask the pope to recognize the divorce but the chancery of the archbishop in paris was not so difficult and before the end of january eighteen ten that body declared his religious marriage null upon the ground of moral coercion during the weeks immediately following the divorce napoleon wrote josephine almost every day and visited her very frequently on christmas day they dined together at the trianon for the last time the emperor was very generous in the financial arrangements he made for his former wife he gave her a million francs for repairs to malmaison and for the purchase of silver and linen and ordered another million advanced to her from her civil list for eighteen ten to pay her debts he also gave his courtiers to understand that in no way could they afford him greater pleasure than by calling on the empress after this the road to malmaison was once more covered with the carriages of visitors the first week in february josephine returned to paris to reside at the elysee which napoleon had given her for a townhouse this palace built in seventeen eighteen had been the residence of madame de pompadour up to the time of her death condemned as national property during the revolution it was bought in eighteen hundred three by murat who sold it to napoleon in eighteen hundred eight at the time he became king of naples it is now the official residence of the presidents of the french republic but josephine's residence there was very short when the news became known the first of march of the early arrival of marie louise she returned to malmaison and at the end of that month she went to the chateau of navarre which the emperor had given her this chateau was a very large building but at the time in a bad state of repair it was surrounded by an extensive park with magnificent trees before the revolution it had been the property of the princes of bouillon who received it from louis the fourteenth here josephine spent the month of april and then returned to malmaison later she made a visit to aix-en-savoie and to geneva and in november she returned to navarre where she remained nearly a year in september eighteen eleven josephine was once more back at malmaison where she remained most of the time during the two following years after his marriage the emperor wrote her very rarely and paid her only a few visits at the time the allies entered paris the last of march eighteen fourteen josephine went to navarre for a month and then returned again to malmaison here she was frequently visited by the czar alexander and the other allied sovereigns who showed her every possible courtesy the last of may she became very ill and a consultation of physicians decided that she had a very serious attack of quinsy for which there was no hope on sunday the twenty ninth of may eighteen fourteen she passed away having nearly completed her fifty-first year the empress josephine says saint amand had merited a very rare thing the sympathies of all parties and the esteem of all nations she had won the respect both of the patriots who defended france and of the strangers who invaded it all classes spoke of her death with emotion the cause of this universal tribute of regret is easy to find josephine avait toujours été bonne End of chapter sixteen